We're live. I'm going to confirm that by pulling up your comment, Z Pack. It's your boy Z Dog MD. If you haven't had a chance yet, become a subscriber because it's dope. Am I right, Tom Heinberg? It's pretty cool. Yeah. I subscribe. Of course you do. Yeah. Because I pay you to subscribe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I pay all my friends, all my friends, and all my exes live in Texas. Anyways, the thing about subscribing, though, seriously, all joking aside, there's no joking aside, is that uh, we have the deeper conversations there. Talk to the supporters who will leave comments to see if it's worth it for four ninety nine a month to have access to. <laughs> it's not worth it, is it, Tom? I think it's worth it. Do you? I get a lot of value at, out of it. Do you? <laughs> get to watch you at your pool, in your backyard. At my most vulnerable. Yeah. At yeah. my most vulnerable when I'm in my pool. Anyway, let's get to our subject. Here. Okay, so here's our subject. We're talking, and here we go. Uh, are we actually live? We are. You are now watching a live video. The broadcaster and other viewers can see that you're watching, too. Thanks. Thanks, Ace. Uh, I want to talk about healthcare worker violence. We, it's been a big part of our movement, this hashtag Silent No More campaign, this idea that we have been quiet about this epidemic that's been growing uh, regarding violence against healthcare practitioners. Now, we've talked about it so much, I feel like anything else we say is redundant, except what I'm going to say now and what Tom is going to talk about with me, which is, what are the root causes of this? We all know that it's not acceptable to hit a healthcare person, a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist. It doesn't matter. You go home health, you fear for your life going into some of these houses. I've heard these stories. I have gotten thousands of messages over the course of doing these shows from people who have been the victims of violence and live in fear, which is you shouldn't be afraid to go to work, right? So what do I think are some of these root causes? And Tom, having recently experienced the other side of this coin with his father in the hospital, what, what does he think? And what, can we come to a, a way to actually make it better? Well, increasingly what we're seeing is we, we didn't see as much of this violence in the old days. And I think there are several factors that go into this. First of all, there's a general erosion of the sacredness of the relationship in healthcare. So it used to be that you had a doctor and a patient or a nurse and a patient in a, in a sacred relationship that was unfettered by all this intrusion of the bureaucracy, the EHR, and the general commodification that's happened to us in health 2.0, where now we're looking at computers, we're worried about pleasing the bean counters, we have this moral injury pulling us in all these different ways. So what ends up happening is patients are treated as commodities because we feel like commodities. And now what happens is the patients are like, well, I'm not, I'm not getting what I need. And if we're all commodities, then I'm gonna teach this commodity a lesson by punching him or her in the face. And I think that's a, an erosion of the humanity in medicine. I think the second thing is we have increased volume, especially in mental illness and substance abuse, opioid dependence. And now you have this very volatile cocktail of people who are suffering a sp specific kind of problem coming in to healthcare settings where in the old days they might have been you know, uh, managed uh, more socially, there might have been less of this. Now the volume is so high, we talked about this on a previous show, they're coming into overwhelmed emergency departments, overwhelmed hospitals, and the, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a powder keg. And it takes one spark and people start swinging. I think that's another piece of it. And the third piece is the goddamn profit structure of how we do medicine. The fact that hospitals make money when we are treated as commodities, when we are raw materials. And that means if the patient is a customer and the customer is always right and the customer hits you in the face or gropes you or spits on you, if we don't treat them like they're right, and make sure that those patient satisfaction scores are high and the press gainy is good and the H caps are high. If we start creating an environment where they feel uncomfortable to punch us, the hospital gets paid less. And so of course the administrators are gonna say, oh, do whatever it takes to keep them happy. Give them the dilata, give them the turkey sandwich. If they hit you, don't press charges. No one cares anyways. It's a part of the job that you're gonna get hit. And we don't want to create this military state with security and all that because it's going to make patients feel like it's not a hotel. So, I mean, that's what it is in my mind. Now, what do you think? Well, you know, as you always point out about Health 1.0, and when you say it, it sounds beautiful. You're like, oh, I was so patient connected and like we were there. 
why why was it that way? Because that's all they had. There was like no real medicine. Yes. So the only medicine you had was Mrs. Jones, I feel your pain and I'm here for you. You know. By, by the way, hashtag me too. Tom just touched me and I did not approve that. <laughs> uh, no, but you're right. Right. Go on. That's what well that's what I'm saying is like uh, now there's nothing like that. So like I think sometimes it's inexcusable to hit anybody ever in life. Period. Like we teach that to kindergartners, right? That's like the first thing you teach them. Except for parents who spank their children. Yeah. Right. Those people are the worst. They are the worst. You should never spank your children. Yeah. By the way, seriously, just a little aside. I know a lot of people believe in corporal punishment. There is no data showing that it does anything but encourage children to think that violence is a solution to problems. So I'm looking you in the eye right now. If you like corporal punishment, if you spank your children, I know you do it for reasons you think are important, and I know you care about your child, and you think that's the only way. It's not. Don't do it. All right, back to this. Well, there's also a thing that you're, when you spank your child, you're going to see the behavior that you were spanking for decrease over a span of two weeks and then come roaring back stronger than ever. So is not that only is, that what it is, yeah, it's yeah. not effective. Mm. It's going to increase the behavior you want to decrease. Mm. So, mm. yeah. But it doesn't feel that way, Tom, because when you hit your child, and I haven't done this, but I've lost my temper with my kids. I've yelled, I've verbally abused them in moments of weakness. And it's a shameful thing for me, but I've done it and I'll admit it and I'll say, I've thought about spanking my kids and I've thought about raging and screaming, but the truth is, it feels like something you wanna do. Right. And think of, now let's translate that's that the, into well, the that's healthcare. The same, yeah. That's the thing I wanna say is like, mm. I've been through this healthcare carousel like uh, a lot lately mm. and it sucks, man. And while I've never hit anybody, I've wanted to hit people mm. for sure. Mm. I just kept it in check, mm. you know? But I'm not an elderly, confused old man who's got dementia. Or someone suffering with alcohol abuse right. who might diminish the inhibition. Or someone who's living in abject poverty who might not have, you know, who was raised in an abusive family. Right. And understands what it's like to be hit and, and to hit others. But why am I feeling like I even want to hit anybody? Tell me about it. Because the process is so goddamn frustrating mm. all of the time. You're sitting in the room, like, and for me, I'm not the patient, I'm the patient advocate. But you know, family members assault healthcare workers all the time, right? All the time. Yeah. So your the families are bigger problems than the patients. Right. Yeah. So you, it, it was like that thing we talked about with Dog the Bounty Hunter, where it was like, if if he if he dies, you die, whatever. Right. You know, she dies, you die. Stupid. That, yeah. Fucking. Yeah. I know. I mean, he's not. He's Dog the Bounty yeah. Hunter. Yeah. I mean, like, you don't what, expect. What can we expect? Brilliance from, from the guy with a mullet. Yeah. Thirty-six percent of people spank their kids, and sixty-four percent don't. Thirty-six percent of people spank their kids, and. 37 and 64 percent. Oh, you changed the thing. You can add them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's I'm gonna, interesting. I'm going to say this again. Because it's culturally acceptable to do this and it feels right, people do it. Every shred of scientific data that we've looked at says it is the wrong, wrong idea. And our intuitions are often wrong. We are raised as bestial animals. We just came out of the primordial soup. Of course, we want to hit things because that's how we evolved. It is the wrong answer for your child. I'm just gonna say that because I'm tired of fucking beating around the bush about shit. If I feel something, all right, I'm just gonna tell you, and if it pisses you off because you spank your kid, then fuck off, seriously. Grow up. It's a bad idea, don't do it. All right, back to this. Imagine if spanking worked, you wouldn't have uh, quarterly reviews. It would just be like, Bob, pull down your pants. <laughs> pull down your pants. <laughs> <laughs> go, get a, a, go get a switch from the backyard. That's an amazing skit, man. <laughs> Corporate spanking. Like, you know, it's time for your quarterly review. Well, there's good news. Your numbers are up. There's bad news. They're up because you committed fraud. All right. <laughs> Drop your pants and you know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And you're going to go in the chokey for exactly. a bit. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But, you know, all right, here's the thing. I was starting to describe. So when you're the patient and you're the patient advocate and you're in the room, it's just this endless flood of people who don't have any answers for you. Everybody just sort of looks at you and then looks at what they're doing and then leaves the room really quickly. You know, you keep asking like, can I talk to the doctor? Can I talk to the social worker? Can I talk to whoever? And they're like, they'll be by at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And you're mm. like, well, fucking great. Mm. What am I supposed to do right now, you mm. know? And then you watch your loved one take a turn for the worse and then you're sitting there with no answers and you go out and talk to the floor nurse and she doesn't have any good answers or, you know, Nobody is paying, you hit the call bell and nobody comes, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
And these are with high, this is, you know, when I was going through this with my father, this is high, a high acuity person. Mm. But it's like, oh, he's dying and, you know, he'll be over there and, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Mm. So it does make you mad enough that you want to hit somebody. You don't know who to hit because this diffusion of responsibility is widespread and like there's no one there's no one single point where you can be like this person is fucking me over but the system is fucking you over and you're having to sit there and endure it and like imagine if I had to go bankrupt because of this as well you know mm. what I mean if this was I knew that this was gonna bankrupt me and I was sitting here being treated like shit I could see it pushing me to a breaking point you know it's funny so not saying it's right it's never right but I can see why it happens uh, uh, we were talking about doing a show today, Tom and I, and, and I was like, I want to talk about healthcare worker violence because it's coming up again. I'm getting a lot of messages from people who've been victimized by this. And I want to go hard on this and I want to talk about, you know, the reasons that it's happening. And Tom said, basically gave me a version of this with a lot more F-bombs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was really, I mean, he was really truly angry because of his recent experience. And it made me think actually quite a bit about, when we become patients, guys, like when we're healthcare workers and become patients, we're in the same position as Tom. We are pissed off. And it's just that little shred of frontal lobe in, it, that, that inhibits us from screaming, from being verbally abusive, from swinging at people, because this is the most emotionally intense environment that you can be in. You're already vulnerable, you feel no sense of control. Now, throw into the mix, let's say it's not Tom, who was born with tremendous amounts of privilege. I mean, I'm talking about off the scale. Off the scale. Imagine now, Tom was physically abused, sees uh, violence as a normal currency of daily life. If this happens, he's gonna come out swinging, right? right. And, and, and the thing is, I think- Violence is a, violence as a virtue too, because in lower income communities, violence is a virtue. It's like, stay away from me. Like, it's, yeah. you know, there's more yeah. of an honor it's culture. strength. There's more of an honor to now, culture going on, and it is strength, yeah. Now, and, and I'm not gonna lay it at the feet only of the, of the disadvantaged, I'll lay it at the feet of the privileged. The privileged come at it from this angle. I am the customer here. Yeah. And you are economically and emotionally hurting me and I'm not being heard. And that allows me, if, even if it's just verbal abuse, to scream and yell and carry on and threaten you. See, that's the thing. Often it isn't the physical violence as much as the threat. Uh, I will find, if, if he die, if, if she dies, you die, that dog the bounty hunter bullshit. And I think, I think that's a huge piece of, uh, of the emotional reaction of this that we have to understand. There are ways to de-escalate people. There are ways to show compassion. There are better ways to communicate. And we have to transform our healthcare system if we're going to, I think part of it is, again, it's increasing because we're really shitty at being a healthcare system. We're a non-system. And we're in this throes of health 2.0, wishing for health 1.0. If we had 3.0, it's gonna be much less likely that we're gonna get this stuff. At Turntable, I remember we had a, a classic drug seeker show up, sign up for 80 bucks and demand a bunch of narcotics. And our team was like, listen, you know, that's not how we work here. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna um, make sure that we, we figure out the root causes of your pain. You're, you know, you, we'll get you hooked up with a pain physician, but right now we really wanna get you hooked up with the coach. And, talk. and the guy was having none of it because yeah. he was the customer. He spent the membership fee and he wanted what he wanted. He's like, you know how much smack I can get on the street for 80 bucks? Exactly. Yeah. Now, at the same time this is going on, I have to be careful not to violate HIPAA. I'm just gonna stop. Anyways, let's just say there was some criminal component right. involved in right. this. And, 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 but the thing is, in general, that was a f way outlier because we didn't make it clear up front who we were. Yeah. And he thought we were somebody else. If you knew who we were, that kind of violence, that kind of escalation, it's just not gonna happen as often. And you're gonna be heard, you know, which I don't, I don't think you were heard when you were in the hospital. Nobody's ever heard in the hospital. No patient is ever heard in the hospital. In the best situation they are, that's the thing. I think I mean, you've had very just, bad experiences. It, yeah, but it's like, that's so rare. That's like, that's like you saying to me like, hey man, McDonald's fries are the best fries. And I'm like, they suck and they taste like trash. And you're like, but when you get there and they just made it and they like just salted it and they're fresh, oh, so good. It never happens. Eh? That, that is probably the worst, best analogy I've ever heard. That's, that's what it is. Imagine if we could. Well, you're saying in the perfect scenario. No, 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 no. If you, you can know. make the fries fresh constantly, McDonald's fries are sublime. They're perfectly salted, they're crispy, 
they have a little steam, and they're affordable. Right. And you know what they cost up front. Why can't we do that in healthcare? I'll tell you why, because all our incentives are wrong. We get paid to do things to people. Yeah. We get paid for throughput. We get paid for patient satisfaction, which is not patient outcomes. I can grant you that in the best case scenario, everything works out, but how often does that happen as a percentage? 1% of the time, 5% of the time max, 95% of the time it's fucked up. Mm in almost every hospital across the country. Well, yeah. Yeah. Weigh in, weigh in, you guys. I've seen it work beautifully, I've seen it work terribly. And I, I used to say, you know, even when I was at Stanford, and I will say I think Stanford is a fan-fucking-tastic place. I think that the doctors and the nurses and the staff there are transcendently good. I saw some of the worst care I've ever seen and I've seen some of the best care I've ever seen. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with how busy we are, what exact staff is going on, what's the interaction, how much transference we have with the patient. Right. And, and, and we can get better though. I've seen, I've seen that holy land happen. Dawn makes an interesting point. She says, I absolutely believe that we have lost respect for each other. And mm. you know, some, some of that is going on. We've lost respect for each other as a society. Mm. Look at the way we treat each other online. Yeah. Right, it's just like, oh, are you a Democrat? Fuck, Fuck you, you. Cuck. <laughs> right? You know cuck. I mean? Did you just call me a cuck, Tom <laughs> Uh By the way, I'm an independent. Right. Um, y y I think that's correct. L you know, it, it kind of ties back to the childhood spanking thing, which, by the way, I went a little hard a little earlier on people who spank. I don't, I don't mean to shame you. What I'm trying to say is, I honestly feel like, and it's hard because, man, there are some people who have kids that are just so challenging. And I'll tell you, like my oldest child, Nina, she, is, she, she was challenging when she was younger. I mean, to the point where Mrs. Dog started buying books about how to deal with strong-willed children and never was hitting them in the cards. But there are ways to do it, but it takes tremendous work, tremendous patience, and almost a transcendent level of patience. And I think in many ways, healthcare is the same way. We cannot resort to hitting. That is the lowest common denominator that never causes any good. But that means we have to put the work in. Yeah. And it's a lot harder not to hit. It really is. It, yeah. It's of a course. lot harder not to hit. Of course. Yeah. Especially when, as a patient, everything is fucking you over. Yeah. Everything. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, at least it, feel, it feels like that. Uh, it's not a good but, but, but experience. Now, you, I've, I've never had a good experience in a hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, fucking never. Mm. You know? But then, I can't think of a single time. But, but you know. 75% of people say their patients are listened to at the hospital. I, I think that's, I, I would put it at 60% of my patients are properly heard in the hospital and the other 40% get a shitty experience. Yeah. Now you've had the shitty experience every time and, and that may be a roll of the dice. It may be that Vegas just fucking sucks for that. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it's not the best place I've been in how many people, I mean, you see so many people in the hospital that sometimes you can have the shitty experience and the good experience back to back, but the good doesn't necessarily outweigh the shitty experience. Well, we have this, bi this bias, right? Yeah. So the way, and let me explain this to you. You're like, I came in and fixed it, but it's like, yeah, well, I've been dealing with it for 14 fucking hours sitting here with all the shitty experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, so the way humans process experience mem memory-wise is they take the peak happy experience and the peak bad experience and then they average it with the last experience they had. So imagine you're, you're the, mostly you're having bad experiences and then your last experience is worse because they've kicked you out or right. something's happened. Your memory of the experience retroactively is the worst experience you've had. Well, right? and why would it not be? Because the good is just basic. It's how basic it's, human decency. It's how it should be. <laughs> right. I'm not getting like. It's not like somebody's like, hey, kick off your shoes. So right. I give you a foot massage. Right. You know, I can see that you're having a hard day. Right, like it's just basic human kindness and basic human decency. So why would I count that as a good experience? You know, you know what's interesting is I, I, everything you say is true, and I felt it, and I know it about my patients. But here's why you'll get so much resistance from a lot of Z packers. I'm not looking at comments right now, but I'll tell you, I'm just guessing. It's because we are very, we are overwhelmed. We're overworked. We recall the worst patients. We don't recall necessarily the best ones. We have a negative recall bias ourselves. We remember the patient who hit us, who spit us, who's entitled, who's just acting like a piece of shit. And we then filter most of our uh, feelings about this interaction, about the patient experience, about our patients heard through that. And so we're flawed in that sense, but we're also 
I think, entitled a little bit to be a bit pissed off, too. And so the question is, can we come together? Can we come up with a, a more transcendent solution? It involves systems change. It involves redesigning kind of incentives. It involves better training. And it involves an assumption that we need to teach patients that violence, verbal aggression, those kind of things have a zero tolerance policy, but that you deserve to be heard, you're in, you have a right to be heard, and if you're not heard, there should be a process, whether it's patient ombudsman, whatever it is, to be heard. It's hard, though. Can you teach that? Like, can you, you, can you teach that? You can condition it. Yeah. You, yeah, we, you can condition it. You're right. It's not simple like, Tom, sit in a class. Listen, right. don't hit people, Tom. <laughs> right. And don't, don't grab your right. nurse's butt, whether, especially if it's a boy, because you'll get punched in the face back. Me and Logan um, made a, a PSA for a hospital one time about, you know, for new parents, mm. about not shaking your baby. And it's like... The Seems people, like common knowledge. The people who would shake their baby are probably going to shake their baby no matter what. Mm. And I was thinking that the whole time we were making this PSA. Mm. You know? Well, this is interesting because it gets to the heart of the heart of we're conditioned creatures, the result of our genetics, our conditioning, our education, and then there's some free will maybe floating around somewhere. How do you recondition people so that these things are just not done? Now, if you look at it, people wear seatbelts now generally. They didn't used to. Right. It's conditioning. People uh, tend not to use the N-word when talking about African Americans anymore. Condition. Condition. Yeah. And people tend to, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that have been reconditioned. Can we recondition violence? Can we recondition spanking? Can we recondition things? I think we can. I'm an optimist about it because I know humans are plastic and they can learn. But you have to start early and you do have to think, you know, you can go hard on personal responsibility. I think we should. Yeah. I think this idea that we let people off the hook is fucking obnoxious and it, it doesn't help the cause. Shaming people directly is also not as highly productive, but right. a broader kind of shame. Like, look, let's make it unacceptable. Yeah. Let's just make it unacceptable. You do it, you're gonna feel shame because you're a piece of shit in society's eyes. Right. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like like the Me Too thing. Like a lot of guys have been like, you know, oh, I, if I was a young man in today's day and age, and uh, I, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, it's like <laughs> it kind of lets me know you might have been a piece of shit when you were younger, <laughs> because it's pretty easy. Like I had a lot of interactions with women, and none of them were rapey. Rape. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. so. You just have to, you have to level up. We mm. all have to level up as, as people. Like, and part of leveling up is not hitting people. It's very basic. I like this idea of leveling up. And, and, and so here's the thing, we can disagree though, and I think you will see disagreement as to what leveling up means. Yes. So imagine in the old days, there might have been disagreement from men about don't hit a woman. Well, you, you know, like Sean Connery, you know, shit hitting a woman across the face is the highest form of flattery. There was that Clint Eastwood movie a while ago where he like, I forget the name of the movie, but at the end of the movie he like beats the shit out of his wife and the townspeople come around and cheer him. Because, Jesus. Because the wife is like a real terrible person, but still. Still. It doesn't. So, so, so. It's the, the same thing as the hospital thing. It's like, no matter how bad your patient care is, I can't take the opposite side of this debate because you just can't hit somebody. You yeah. can never hit yeah, somebody. Exactly. But see, but you're, re you're conditioned differently. So people who think it's okay to hit people in certain circumstances, and I'm going to include parents who spank their children, um, they need yeah, to... because you're hitting a person. You're hitting a person. Not we only call, a person. We call it spanking, but you're hitting you're your hitting, child. You're hitting a child, and yeah. it's a vulnerable person. And even if they're being a little bitch ass, which, listen, my kids are. They will do that to me. Yeah. Uh, you don't you don't inflict physical suffering on another human being or a conscious creature if you can avoid it. And that is because I'm conditioned a little different. Now, hey, 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 hold on. My parents, look it, guys, I'll tell you this. I don't say this publicly. My parents are from India. You don't think, you don't think they did corporal punishment? You don't think it was like part of my upbringing to be at least living under the threat that, you know, dad was gonna take his belt off? Like, holy shit. And you don't think that affected my thoughts on violence? Like when I was younger too, when my T levels weren't as low as they are now in my fading old age, I, I mean, it was hard to control impulses to hit stuff. It really was. And it's, this, it's the same at sexual control, like impulse control. These things can be improved. They can be conditioned. We have a rider on top of our elephant that can get control if you are aware and you're doing the right things on the path the elephant and the rider walk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a show like this, so people will say, Z-Dog, you're an asshole. No, I hit my kids, whatever. 
The reason I do these shows is to start to recondition the path. And if even a couple people are like, you know what, maybe it's a bad idea, they've just leveled up. And I do think it's leveling up. We can disagree that it is. Data doesn't lie. Science doesn't right. lie. Right? There's a, well, that's sort of, isn't that sort of the transpartisan divide is like, the Democrats want society to level up, and the Republicans want individuals to level up, and both need to happen simultaneously. What an interesting angle on that. Let me repeat that and understand it. The Democrats want society to level up. Right. Republicans want individuals to level up. I'm gonna, think about that for a second. They're both right. <laughs> they both are true but partial. That's beautiful. Why can't we love each other? Why can't we? Right? You know? Both those things are true. Yeah. And you know what? On, on this show, half the time I take one tact and half the time I take the other. Right. Like, remember, I do the piece on, um, you know, the, the people who leave their kids in cars. You take the tact that that's their responsibility. They fucked up. Yeah. And I take the tact that this is a human mind. We need to create systems that prevent this from happening. Right. We're both right. This next one, obesity. I'm like, parents need to fucking man up and stop feeding their kids shit. And you would agree with me. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. But, but many very smart people said, no, 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 this is a societal thing. We're feeding people. We're creating entities that push crappy food and food deserts and socioeconomic stuff. We're both right. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. In my mind, it all comes back to personal responsibility because that's the only thing you can control as an individual. And systems change is hard, right? It's really hard. Uh, okay, yes, I agree. But no, 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 I, I, can yeah? see, I can see where... I can see where you, you can change things along the way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I was watching this, docu this great documentary on Quincy Jones, it's on Netflix, mm -hmm. and basically, you know, all the black entertainers used to have to sleep at the black motels mm -hmm. uh, across town in the ghetto, and like the ghetto in Las Vegas, as you, we both know, is not a nice ghetto. Mm -mm. And uh, Frank Sinatra was the one who was like, nope. And he, just one guy, he put a stop to the entire system. Suddenly they were allowed to go to the casinos, sleep in the regular hotels like the regular performers, you know, people like Harry Belafonte and Sammy Davis Jr. and Quincy Jones. Like, they were allowed to be there because they were making money for the casino like any normal person would be allowed to. And so it just took him to stand up and say, this is wrong, and it did change. It well, changed the system. Well, no, this is a beautiful example. So because you have an individual, Frank Sinatra, who wasn't really known for his lack of racism. No, he wasn't a racist. Mm. He wasn't. Womanizer. Yeah. Big time womanizer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he yeah. was just an old school, like, ah, smoke, da 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 yeah. He actually was, yeah, he was a notorious, he was not, he was anti-racist. Got it. I okay. mean, he I, was hiring black producers back in the day, black bammer, Sammy Davis Jr. Okay, like, I, didn't, I didn't realize he was kind of known for that. Oh, yeah. So, so, so that being said. I'm sure he had whatever the times were. Like, oh, yeah, you know, everybody does. Yeah. But, but so he's an individual who actually changed a societal stricture. Now the society is different. So it is all one continuum, Tom Heinebar. Each is true but partial. Yes. You need personal. So this is the problem. This is the problem that I have. We ignore personal responsibility at our peril. We ignore societal and governmental inputs at our peril. We need both. And that means that there is, no, there is no absolute right on the right or the left. It's a emergent from both. And the problem now is we're so polarized, we each stake our claim and our elephant sits there and goes, I feel this way. But the truth is, it's much more complex than that. If we can actually, yeah. and I mean, you know what? You have to make yourself a little vulnerable, I think, in order to admit that you know whatever political stance you take is more nuanced than it's just black and white. Right. If say you know what th these guys are right too, and I'm going to stop villainizing, demonizing them. Right. Uh, Wouldn't that be amazing? We used okay. to call that being an adult. <laughs> <laughs> All of society has regressed to childhood, yeah, exactly. which is why we're punching people in, like, the, in the ear. I feel ways about things. <laughs> Tweet. Right. Hashtag sad. <laughs> Um, Do we solve it? I, th I feel like we solved it. I think we it. solved it. Tom Heinebro, are we best friends now? I think we just became, I think best, we just friends. became best friends. By the way, bro, I just want to let you know that uh, if you want fresh fries, you just have to call, say you want them unsalted, and then you put the salt on yourself because they got to make a new batch for the unsalted. It's a hack. It's a life hack, people. This guy right here mm -hmm. just changed my life. That's right. They'll spit in them if you do that. They'll spit in them? For really? <laughs> oh, dear God, Logan. Thank you for telling me. Logan used to work at McDonald's. He didn't. Did, Did you? Do you have a mic on you now or no? no? Okay, so Logan just said he used to work at McDonald's and it's horrible. To tell me more and I'm gonna relay it, it to the- It was horrible, Z. I worked there for three months and I realized that I never ever want to have a job again, ever. And so now I do this. 
I'm not going to repeat that because Logan basically compared this job to slightly better than McDonald's. Um, on that note, guys, the pitch for becoming a supporter means you want to go even deeper than we went now. Almost every night I do a show just one-on-one -on -one with supporters, and it's a tribe of about 1,400 plus people now that are deeply, deeply engaged, and I think they feel heard, and I definitely feel heard when I do shows with them. You know, it, it really, really helps us understand the deeper issues, get your voice in it, and then it comes and informs the main page. They also get early releases of videos, some stuff that we don't release for anybody else, and discount codes and merch and stuff on that. But I think really the value, if you talk to supporters and they leave comments here, is, is the this. So if you want to do that, hit the little button. We'll put a link in the, in the comments to do that. And uh, let us know what you think about these issues, because your opinion does matter. We'll ignore it, especially if it's wrong. Then we'll make fun of you. But we went, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Are we out, Tom Heinemer? Don't hit your kids. Yeah, really, really, Don't seriously. Hit your kids. Seriously, seriously. Don't hit your kids, really. I know it feels right, and I know you think you're doing the right thing. You're not a bad person, but you're doing a bad behavior that needs to level up. All right, thank you. I love you. We out. <laughs>